screen on. All right. So my name is Kaylin Harold Rowe. She, her pronouns. I go to UNCG. I live in Greensboro. And yeah. Doing school <laughs> And my name is Morgan Sellers. I live in um, Greensboro now, and I am a junior at UNCG, and um, my pronouns are she and her, and I am doing this project for my oral history interview. All right. I don't know if I mentioned I'm a senior. Okay. That's so cool. <laughs> are you excited? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask you a couple questions about your involvement in the Black Lives Matter movement in Greensboro. Um, and my first question is, where are you from? I am originally from uh, Port St. Lucie, Port St. Lucie, Florida. It's a southeast city. Mm -hmm. uh, I call Hillsboro, North Carolina, my home. Cool. Me too. <laughs> and um, describe your experience growing up in Hillsboro. So I went, I completed eighth grade in high school, all of my high school years in Hillsboro. And I would describe it as a, um, a Southern culture, but then a, even a closer context, it was high school culture. So just rules that don't apply in real life applied there. Yeah, I totally understand that completely. <laughs> um, when would you say that you became aware of like racial differences? Mm. Or did you ever become aware of racial differences growing up? Like, Yeah, mm -hmm. I did, I would say in Florida, it wasn't as direct. Actually, no, I, I did learn about it in Florida when Trayvon Martin was um, killed by Zimmerman mm -hmm. in Sanford, Florida. That is what I learned, like truly. Yeah, that was tragic for everybody. That was hard. Um, did you have any specific instances that maybe caused you to come that maybe caused you to become aware of racism growing up? Yes, but not until I was able to reflect on it afterwards, because when I was in it and getting like racial comments, because it was high school and like the only like priority I had was belongingness, wanting to be um, accepted and normal. Mm -hmm. So I anything as problematic till reflecting on it later but yeah in like freshman year of high school immediately just comments um uh, yeah I don't know if you want me to say them specifically <laughs> no you can this is an open interview I want you to tell it raw like what you experienced basically I was gonna, the worst thing with my hair I would uh, for freshman year and into sophomore year, I straightened it religiously because the boy I had a crush on was like, when are you gonna straighten your hair again? I really like it when you straighten your hair. It looks way better. Just like uh, comments, just telling me to straighten my hair. Yeah. And I did, and then I had to like do a big chop years later because it was so damaged. I'm sorry you had to go through that. No problem. I'm going to grab my laptop charger real quick. Okay. And another thing that was very obvious was that my school was segregated. Like, there was a black table and a white table and a table with Asian Americans and a table with mm -hmm. people who dyed their hair and um, a table with the low income white people rather than like the preppy people. So that was also very right in my face. Yeah. 
definitely know what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then my next question is, um, was there anyone who gave you guidance or advice about navigating racism? No, I have, so I'm mixed. I have a white mom and a black father. And my white mother at the time when I was younger was going through her own problems of like not understanding Black Lives Matter or um, racial injustice. So I did not have guidance from her and my dad didn't really talk a lot. So uh, no, I had, no, I didn't. Okay. And um, why did you become interested in protesting? Because I've always been an advocate at heart, like in any type of context, whether that's like women's rights or people with disabilities, their rights, mm-hmm. um, these rights, indigenous people's rights. And that was always, always for me. That's so good. I love that because I feel like everybody needs a voice, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I feel like you're bringing awareness to that. And you're speaking your mind. <laughs> um, during a pandemic, how comfortable were you during the protesting? This year? Mm-hmm. The COVID? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uncomfortable, but at the same time, I think it's more of like a wanting to pretend COVID isn't real. Like everyone was wearing masks. But I definitely wanted to focus more on the protest than COVID, selfishly, right? Mm-hmm. Can you go into a little bit of detail, like, what was it like on the grounds during the protest? So in Greensboro, we have a park in downtown. Not remembering the name, but it's with that big structure, or like sculpture on top, like the thread. It's like this big piece downtown in this park. And that's where the presenters were because there's a stage and there was a mm-hmm. good amount of presenters um, before we did the actual march. So everyone was crowded there, spacing out or like becoming more sparse the farther you went away from the stage. But we, I was definitely like, like next to someone. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, did you ever feel like your life was in danger during the protests? No, I did not. I felt very happy because I also think that the Black Lives Matter protest going on in 2020 is mm-hmm. very powerful. So I def- I think that was uh, very clear to me at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was history. Yeah, it is. I think, um, like, did you feel knowing or seeing what was happening on the news around with other protests going around, I mean, going on around the country, did you ever like stop and think like, oh, like maybe this could happen to me or? A hundred percent, like before when we were going to the protest, um, there was a lot of like preparing, like the people that I was with was more aware of that I would say Mm-hmm. Um, writing down their numbers and stuff mm-hmm. on their arms. Let me think about what they else they did. Wearing stuff that wouldn't identify them. Um, yeah. So there's definitely prep. But yeah. When we were there, like it was fine. I definitely gave dirty looks to the police that were there, but they were just kind of, um, they're like surveilling, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Are you involved in any organizations that are centered around helping other black youth? No, I am not. Okay. And have you been a part of other protests in the past? Yes, many. Um, which ones? So this year I went to two. I went to the one in Greensboro and I went to the one in Chapel Hill. Mm-hmm. Dark differences just because of like, um, 
different populations. Like UNC Chapel Hill was all white people. Mm -hmm. And Greensboro was all black people. Um, and then in the past, I went to the Women's March in DC in 2017, which was awesome. I that also- That is so cool. Right? <laughs> Trump's inauguration. So I was there when he was inaugurated and protest that. Um, let me think, because I know there's more. I have different stuff on my wall, so I'm trying to see if I remember. That's what I can think of right now. Okay, that's so cool though. So what would you say was the difference between the Women's March versus the Black Lives Matter protests that you were involved in? The Women's March was huge. Like the loop that we were supposed to do was completely filled by people. So we weren't able to move. That mm -hmm. one definitely felt very like, and like when we were going there, everyone on the subway was like headed also to the march also. Like the atmosphere in DC that day was electric. It was awesome. And I would say the Greensboro one was just more of a local, um, protest so it wasn't as big and it was shorter like we did the presentations which were mm -hmm. incredible speakers and then we did the loop to the courthouse where it was also a great scene and it reminded me of the women's march actually because there were people on the buildings oh cool yeah so there are similarities but I think the major difference was just like size yeah mm -hmm. do you feel like um there are people coming outside from Greensboro, like, and joining the Greensboro's March, Greensboro March, if that makes sense. I think it's possible, but I don't, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> um, where do you envision the Black Lives Matter movement in 10 years from now? In 10 years from now, I imagine they're, it's somehow being incorporated into a party inside of the U.S. government. Like if, uh, no, this is what I, this is what I would like, not what I can actually see, if that's okay, because I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would be awesome is if we moved from a two-party, like, way of functioning the government, mm -hmm. politics, and moved towards having groups of representing different minorities and different like sections of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So like there would be a whole Black Lives Matter group, a party that would have input in policy making along with other people. Yeah, that would be really cool. And I guess that would like bring more awareness and like basically force the conversation almost. It would, so yeah, that it couldn't be ignored. It would give us a voice rather than having to be like mobilizing and like getting all these different minorities together to be able to have a voice, mm -hmm. we all have a voice. I totally agree. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to interview you. I had so much fun getting to know you and your experience during the protest. And thanks, it was great. <laughs> Of course. And Morgan, it was great to see you. Like very nice to see a familiar face. And yes. I, I will make sure to fill out the form you sent me. It might not be till later tonight, but I'll get that to you. Okay. Thank you. Do you need it by? Um, I'll probably need it by tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Because, okay. I'll get it today. Thank Thanks. And it was great seeing you again and everything and talking to you and all that. Yes. Okay. Well, bye, Morgan. Have a great day. Bye. You too.